Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are discussing whistleblowers and Julian Assange and Iran and Palestine with Roots Action whistleblower advocate Jeffrey Sterling. Jeffrey Sterling is a former CIA case officer who was at that agency, including the Iran task force for nearly a decade. He filed an employment discrimination suit against the CIA, but the case was dismissed as a threat to national security. He served two and a half years in prison after being convicted of violating the Espionage Act but no incriminating evidence was produced at trial and Jeffrey continues to profess his innocence. His memoir, Unwanted Spy, The Persecution of an American Whistleblower was published in late 2019. Jeffrey Sterling, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Hey, thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for continuing to do what you're doing. Let's get an an update on Julian Assange. Uh, Where do things stand for him? Well, I think things stand for him now. Nobody knows. Uh, I think we're la- his latest appeal and his last appeal to the UK courts uh, is coming, but no one knows when that date's going to be set uh, for him to appeal uh, you know, the extradition to the United States. Uh, it's sort of in a limbo. And I, I think it's uh, really similar to the situation in the world with Assange. I mean, well, here anyway with Assange. I mean, nobody knows, nobody hears anything uh, about uh, what's going on with Assange. And I think that is really indicative of the entire situation with him. Uh, There needs to be more attention in this country. The rest of the world seems to know the issues uh, with regard to him, but except the, (laughs) the United Kingdom. But um, here in this country, there just seems to be an uh, information blackout, if you will, uh, about the situation with Assange as he waits what is more than likely his last, and I fear to say, appeal that will fail. His last appeal will fail and he will be extradited to a United States prison. Uh, is that your expectation? That is, uh, without any sort of dropping of the charges, which we know will not happen, or or maybe some negotiation for a lesser charge with the Justice Department, uh, I I feel like he is going to lose his appeal, um, and he will be extradited uh, to the United States to face charges of violating the Espionage Act. And uh, he will first, of course, his destination will be the Alexandria jail where I was held after being arrested uh, for violating the Espionage Act and uh, facing the court that is in the backyard of the CIA, the Eastern District of Virginia. I remember well your trial. Um, it, It seems that your supposed violation of the Espionage Act was revealing the CIA giving nuclear secrets to Iran and Julian Assange's supposed violation of the Espionage Act is revealing to the public the uh, war crimes of the United States military. It's hard to see what either of these things has to do with espionage. Well, that's uh, because the the term whistleblower, uh, it it is, you know, who's defining that term Uh, in my case and in Julian Assange's case. I mean, we're not, we weren't whistleblowers, we were leakers, we were traitors to the United States. Um, So, and the dialogue is being controlled and has been controlled by the government, uh, the one who's being accused of doing wrongdoing in both cases. Um, So they control the dialogue. So, you know, these whistleblowers are a uh, persona non grata. They're a four letter word. Uh, And the U.S. engages in, I think, character assassination uh, with regard to whistleblowers who reveal information about wrongdoing uh, by the government. Um, In my case, you know, they were complaining, uh, asserting that I was uh, angry, uh, disgruntled employee because I lost my discrimination suit. Well, that wasn't true. I didn't lose it. I wasn't able to go forward because uh, you know, a black man fighting for his civil rights is a threat to national security. Well, we have Assange, and that's been one of the biggest, I think, character assassination campaigns that I've seen in my lifetime. Um, you've got Congress, you've got elected officials calling him a traitor, uh, Trump, I think he famously said, we know what to do with individuals like that. I mean, 
It's all about character assassination and not about the information or the acts that were revealed. They changed the dialogue. They changed the emphasis to the individual. And that's what it's been. That's what's been happening with Assange. You know, he's a bad person. Um, he's he put the U.S. interests in in danger, our national defense in danger. Uh, but we're not. You know, where is a discussion about the the atrocities and the Ill illegalities that he revealed? Um, how you get away from that sort of thing is you blame the messenger uh, to get away from the message. They, they have kind of tried to portray him as a leaker uh, in alleging, apparently without uh, evidence, that he somehow uh, uniquely assisted whoever actually leaked information to him, who used it as a journalist. Uh, and isn't it, 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 isn't it somewhat new to be calling someone who's not from the United States a traitor to the United States? Is it because the United States is more understanding itself as being entirely dominant of the globe or is it because australia is part of the united states or isn't this kind of new and different i don't think it's all that well it's not different i, I think the u.s is asserting in, in the way they're using the espionage act to reach beyond the borders of this country i mean think about it they're charging an Australian citizen of breaking a U.S. law, and they're reaching beyond our borders. And there's you know, the U.K. and other countries have been just all too willing to to participate in that you know legal atrocity. And you know, in my case, the SP, I mean, you know, I was charged with violating the Espionage Act. Uh, one, there was no evidence. I did not reveal classified information. Yet, uh, to you know, the, the vindictive government that it is, you know, using the Espionage Act to charge me. I mean, they're being able to expand and broaden this act because courts are all too willing to agree with the government on any assertions about uh, national defense or dangers to national defense. So the government is being really encouraged to use it against whoever. Uh, and we're talking here and, and wherever. And what we're talking here is individuals who reveal damning information about the government. Um, and I, I think the danger here is that by the Espionage Act, if you read it, not only do you are you open to prosecution if you're the individual who conveys classified information related to national defense, but even if you hold that information, you can be charged. And that is exactly what's happening with Assange. Um, and I think this expanding, you know, beyond the uh, intent, the expansion of the Espionage Act is being encouraged by countries like the UK who are willing to just fall in line with it. Um, and that danger presents itself not only to, you know, individuals, but, you know, journalism, you know, as a whole throughout the world. The U.S. is showing with the Espionage Act, it will reach out to anyone, anywhere, if you reveal any classified information that the U.S. considers classified, it will reach you anywhere that they can, which is pretty much, in this case, the entire world. And a lot of the world, a lot of the Western you know, world is sitting by and allowing it to happen. And, but not entirely, right? We now have some members of the Australian Parliament, the Australian Prime Minister, I mean, the government of Australia is saying, no, don't do this. That that seems like it ought to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And the media outlets, while yes, engaging in this horrible smearing of Julian Assange for years and years now without let up, have also put out a statement. The big media outlets uh, finally, after many years, put out a statement saying that uh, that this is a threat to journalism, uh, which seems which seems extremely unusual and ought to make yeah. a difference. Um, is is anything? Is there anything that can make a difference here? Um, I'm not sure. I think. The voices that are starting to make I mean, the process with Julian Assange has taken so long. It's been going on for years. I think now he's been locked up in Belmarsh prison prison for close to five years, uh, at least four and a half. And you know, in this time period, people are starting to realize, and you get more and more information uh, about you know the situation, why he's being held, you know, the appeals, how he's failing these appeals. 
And I think countries before had issues with it, but they were being silent because you, you don't want to upset big brother United States. Uh, but now this process has taken so long, I think voices are starting to come out, you know, beyond this country. It's like, you know, this is wrong. Um, and why? I mean, release the charge. I mean, think about it. If he is brought back here and put on trial uh, and found guilty, uh, the amount of time based on how courts have been sentencing individuals who have either pled to violating the Espionage Act or, in my case, you know, found guilty through a full trial, um, he's already spent beyond that time. Uh, so would the U.S. at this point say, well, if he's found guilty, uh, he's going to be released for time served anyway? Um, but would they recognize that sort of thing? But so in, in the whole situation with that, and now people are understanding the number of years it could be facing, uh, what this means for journalism. At first, everyone was wanting to separate themselves from Julian Assange, especially journalists. Um, you know, they say, oh, no, uh, we're not the same as Julian, you know, New York Times reporters or things like that. It's like, well, you look at the situation, look at the Espionage Act. New York Times reporters, uh, independent reporters, reporters anywhere in the world, you are open prey to the U.S. using the Espionage Act. Uh, so maybe it's just that the, the time that all this has taken uh, has uh, awakened people, you know, beyond this country. I mean, I think still in this country, people don't, all they see is that he's a, he's a traitor to the U.S. Uh, but some voices are, are starting to rumble. But uh, I, I, I think the process is going to continue. He's going to be extradited. Uh, and I think actually right now the U.S. is in a position, uh, the Justice Department is in a position that there's no way they're going to stop it. Maybe there could be a negotiation for lesser charges, but as far as dropping the charges, I don't think that's going to happen. And, you know, forgive me for droning on, but one aspect is if they drop the charges against Julian Assange, you know, essentially, they, the Justice Department would in, essentially have to do the exact same thing with Donald Trump. Uh, and how often has our Justice Department or our legal system uh, stepped back and said, uh, we made a mistake, that sort of thing? Well, I, I wanted to ask you because the Obama administration didn't bring these charges. The Trump administration did. But as with 85 other policy issues, the Biden administration has stuck with the Trump policy. Uh, yeah. But why can you explain that for us? Why would dropping the charges in Assange's case require dropping them in in Trump's case? Just the political aspect of it. Uh, and for the Justice Department. Now, if anyone is the poster child for use of the Espionage Act, the way it has been used beyond its intent uh, against whistleblowers, particularly, uh, Donald Trump is the whistle is the poster child for its use. I mean, he has, he did engage, I mean, to his own admission and to the, the piles of evidence against him, you know, supporting these charges against him. Um, if anyone is going to be charged with violating the Espionage Act, it has to be Donald Trump. Julian Assange has been charged with it based on its, its, its use. So if all of a sudden the Justice Department changes course and says, okay, we're not going to use this against whistleblowers or leakers, as the government would say, uh, so we'll drop the charges against Assange, but necessarily, and I think they would be required, they was, and I think the political pressure would be tremendous to then drop the charges against Donald Trump. Uh, all I can do is hope you're wrong, because it seems a shame to, to drop a completely baseless case and be required to drop a, a, a case that seems to have strong evidence. Um, but I'd Absolutely. be happy. I mean yeah, and I think that's a lot of the basis of the use for the Espionage Act. The government uses the Espionage Act, and I want to be clear, because it's easy for the government to bring charges of the Espionage Act. When they charge anybody, it's a it's a we say so law. It's a strict liability law. So if you're charged with it, there is no affirmative defense you can make for uh, I was doing something in the public interest. Uh, the government can or the government can refuse uh, to reveal any evidence that they have against you know, a defendant in, in espionage cases. The courts are all too willing to go along with whatever the government says, especially with regard to classified information. 
So there's really no, there is no loss here uh, in just that win-lose situation for the Justice Department in using the Espionage Act. It, it's, it's, it's the home run hit uh, in a courtroom. Uh, I mean, it is the you know, um, <laughs> indefensible offense, if you will, um, that the government can use. Uh, you know, the, the, everything is within the government's control. What evidence is presented, how it's presented, what the defendant is able to say. I mean, in whistleblower cases, I mean, the government will fight you know, vehemently to prevent the term whistleblower from, from even being mentioned during a trial. Um, and that just shows that you know, the, the power that the government has using the, the Espionage Act and, and how you know, there's really no one going to be safe uh, in this way of this continued use. Well, you know, at Roots Action, we've encouraged the prosecution of Donald Trump and the impeachment of Donald Trump for dozens of different offenses uh, since before he first entered the White House, uh, you know, from instigating violence at his rallies on through. Uh, and I would be happy uh, to see him prosecuted. He is being prosecuted for a number of other things, but I would yes. be happy to see him prosecuted in a dozen other ways uh, that he never has been. Uh, if this one were dropped, um, we, yeah. we're speaking with Jeffrey Sterling, who uh, works at Roots Action as whistleblower advocate. Jeffrey, you wanted to talk also about Iran, and I want to yeah. get to that topic, which is related to your own uh, experience yes. whistleblowing. Yeah, I, I think the situation, just with the Hamas attack and the Israeli response, I, I think it has made me recall a question I think I've had my entire life. You know, is peace possible in the Middle East? And I, I think the approach that we've all made, that the U.S. has made, the West has made with regard to the Middle East is that, no, it, it's not possible. It's not going to be possible. And so therefore you have, I mean, is the U.S. really considering the situation with Iran uh, in the Middle East? I mean, the, uh, we have no relations with the Iranians. Um, the Iranians, of course, have very bad relations with Israel. And so through supporting Israel in what is essentially turning into a genocide there in, the West, in Gaza, are, is the U.S. really considering Iran? And I would kind of say, I don't, it doesn't seem like it. Uh, it. It's like the U.S. and our interests there in the Middle East are saying, hey, this is what we're going to do, uh, Islamic world, Arabic world in, in the area, Muslim world, um, and you're not going to be able to do anything to stop us. Uh, we dare you to do anything. I mean, why is the U.S. sending... Uh, aircraft carriers, you know, to be parked outside, you know, the area of Israel. I mean, why are we doing that? Unless to show that this, you know, to show sort of a, a dominance in the region and a a daring out to the other other countries uh, to do something about it. And I, I think the the response is one of resistance. I mean, Iran supports Hamas. They support Hezbollah. Where we have they call their uh, axis of resistance. And what else is going to come about with this continued genocide, the continued slaughter of the Palestinians? What other resistance movements are going to be created as a result? Uh, I don't think anyone is considering those. I mean, you look at the position, I mean, no one, you, there's no universal call for a ceasefire. I mean, in what bloodletting situation is a ceasefire not called for ever in the history of the world? Um, so, so we're essentially saying, let the murder continue. Uh, you know, there's no good, there, there's no uh, good actors on either side of this, on the Israeli side or the Palestinian side or the side of Hamas. Yet the U.S. is taking the position that it's us against them. And the us is the U.S. and Israel, the them is Palestinians and pretty much, I think, any Middle Eastern country. And I think the response from Iran is they're, they're waiting and because I, I don't think they feel that their uh, interests are being considered in this aspect. 
I, I think uh, there is opposition in much of the world. Uh, there are huge rallies around the world. And I think the United Nations would have uh, voted over a month ago to demand a ceasefire if not for the United States government and its special privileges at the United Nations, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when has the U.S. and its actions and in, in conveying our interests throughout the rest of the world really followed or even recognized international law other than our own spin on it? I mean, United Nations, when it comes to actions by the U.S., is pretty much a, a figurehead movement. I mean, it, it's it's pretty much worthless. The U.S. has already, you know, through the history of the U.N., it doesn't have to accept or abide by any resolutions from the UN if it chooses not to do so. Uh, so, but I, I think, I mean, you, you're absolutely right. There, and I'm really encouraged that there are so many more rising uh, demonstrations, you know, pro-Palestinian demonstrations. Uh, I think people are maybe getting a little tired of, you know, okay, wait, let, let's look at this situation um, and for the reality of it and not the spin that's given to us. You know, when I worked at the CIA, it was, you know, I always kind of wondered uh, at times, uh, was the work I was doing there to protect our national interests and our national security, or was it there to protect our war making, uh, to pre present and encourage our use of our tremendous military industrial complex? Um, and, you know, as opposed to preventing war or things like that. I think the aspect of not calling for a ceasefire and not supporting a ceasefire is, well, I mean, let's think about one other aspect. What are contractors making off of our support uh, during this military action uh, there in, in Gaza? It's a horrible huge, situation. Huge, huge piles of money, of course, uh, from the U.S. government, not from the Israeli government. Um, I... I I, I've always thought, as you know, that this effort that you revealed to give nuclear plans to Iran with slight errors in them that were noticeable by anybody, uh, not by me, but by anybody who understands <laughs> nuclear plans, uh, was an effort to plant evidence on Iran as part of a decades-long effort to falsely accuse Iran of things. Um, is, is that your understanding as well? Uh, you know, when I was involved in the operation, it was presented to me as an effort to thwart um, their use or, or development of nuclear weapons. Um, as time passed and as my understanding of that operation changed because I learned that I was essentially lied to. Um, and then after being kicked out of the agency, you come to the realization that what was the real purpose of that operation? You know, and I had the absolute right to reveal that information to the Senate Intelligence Committee and the House Intelligence Committee, as I did, because concern about wrongdoing of my government and supporting, uh, you know, Iran's development of nuclear weapon. But then I thought, well, especially when we went into Iraq, and the whole aspect of finding evidence of Saddam Hussein uh, developing nuclear weapons, and I always had a thought that if we find <laughs> Don't, I was not going to be surprised if during one news report, news uh, conference, that our government revealed, oh, we found plans to a nuclear weapon uh, in Iraq. Um, and I think that was the purpose uh, for Operation Merlin uh, with regard to Iran, to plant evidence and somehow mm -hmm. miraculously be found uh, and therefore to continue uh, world pressure against Iran. Um, I, I, you know, that's not how, of course, it was presented to me. Uh, but as time went on, that really is the only aspect of it that makes sense. And as I recall, it was at your trial that I saw a document that they introduced into evidence uh, against you, uh, quite recklessly, I think, from their point of view, that showed that they wanted to do the same thing next with Iraq. Absolutely. Um, when I was uh, part of the operation, you know, it was going successfully. You know, the comment was, "Wow, there are some other eyes that we can use this against as well." Um, and and so, you know, what was the success that the, during my trial that the CIA was touting and saying that was ruined because I allegedly revealed the information to the press? 
um, you know, what was that success? The success was it was a it was a purposeful campaign um, of disinformation, uh, dangerous disinformation, if you will. Yeah, I, 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 I've always wondered about this this notion of making peace in the Middle East, uh, in, in Palestine. Uh, of what people mean when they say there could be a two-state solution, um, because one of the states is understood to be and to remain a hate apartheid state. Um, it, it's you know it's the two-state solution strikes me as shipping everybody of African descent to Liberia or carving out a piece of the West to give to the the former slaves and they have their own country. It it strikes me as as madness, where the solution to Jim Crow wasn't to, for the United States to surrender to its enemies, the terrorists, it was to include everybody in one, it is a work in progress, obviously, if it ever succeeds, but to include everybody in one state. How, what, what do you make of this idea of a two-state solution in Palestine? Well, uh, I think theoretically, a two-state solution could be there, but who is defining what those states are going to be? You have the oppressor saying, well, oh, two-state system. Well, a two-state system acceptable to the oppressor is pretty much an open-air prison being ruled by the, the majority or the, those who are in power there. Um, you know, as, and and how, do you how do they define state? Um, is it uh, a, a autonomous uh, a state that they're talking about? I don't think so. I, I, I think their view of a two uh, two state uh, solution is, I think, as you said, we'll continue the way it was. Um, the settlements will continue. Um, uh, Israel will, will be blameless in any and everything, and uh, that will be our version of peace in the Middle East. And I think the the entire process is also. Um, the U.S. saying to the other individual, you know, other countries in the Middle East, we don't care what your position is. We feel like uh, we know what's best for the Middle East. Yeah, we uh, we got about one minute left. Uh, <laughs> very quickly, what what should we be uh, trying to do instead? Well, first and foremost, you know, let, let's have a real ceasefire, not just a pause, uh, a real ceasefire, real negotiations with third parties uh, handling, you know, arbitrators in, in any sort of negotiation. Uh, we need to recognize that you know, the Palestinians are human beings as well. And I think that it's been gone far too long that they have been seen as less than human or less than worthy of survival uh, in, in that region of the world. Yeah, uh, we've been speaking with Jeffrey Sterling, RootsAction.org, whistleblower advocate. Jeffrey, thanks for everything you're doing and for coming on Talk World Radio. My pleasure. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at RootsAction.org. Help end war at WorldBeyondWar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.